Yeah, welcome everybody. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the to a new webinar series um, organized from the European Society of Microbacteriology. Um, I would also say thank you first of all to the Watson team who organized this meeting and who made it possible that we can broadcast this um, on, on YouTube as well and to have a broad audience hopefully. I cannot yet see how many people we are here but I'm sure there are a lot of familiar people I, I know from the society and particularly I would like to introduce for the today's um, seminar Florian Maurer from from Boston, from the National Reference Center for Mycobacteria. And we will also have Charles Lillebeck from the Staten Serums Institute in Copenhagen and Natalia Schubratze from the National Center for TB and Lung Diseases in Georgia. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you are all here. Um, you will give us a, a unique perspective from, from your countries um, about the um, European healthcare system and perspectives uh, on TB diagnostics. And um, you will present how your setup um, is arranged and, and the challenges in, in your particular settings with regard to TB incidents, of course. Um, we agreed that we will do one um, presentation together. So um, you can, of course, already um, um, write your questions in the chat. When, when you come across um, an interesting point and we will address it then after the talk. Um, please also mention briefly your, your affiliation then. And yeah, I mean, that's it basically. So I think we can right jump into the presentation then. And I'm handing over to the speakers now and I'm looking forward to the talks. Right. Okay. So thanks a lot, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm Florian Maurer from Boston. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Matthias. Um, thanks a lot also for uh, to ESM and what's on for organizing this and for having us. Many thanks. Um, so I think one uh, thing that we should point out is that um, we'll have two more webinars coming up um, on June 3rd and on June 10th um, with Jakob van Ingen, who many of you will also know, speaking about NTM, and then also um, Harald Hoffmann, also from Germany, and um, Simon um, Tiberi from the UK, um, speaking about pre-analytics. So that might also be quite interesting um, for everybody. So without further ado, um, Let's dive right in to our today's topic. So the overall idea is to, um, well, present three European healthcare system perspectives on TB care and um, in the light of some recent developments in the field, um, which I will outline as a start. Um, so basically what we want to cover today in today's session is, uh, are a couple of questions. Um, how is TB care and particular diagnostics organized in different European countries? And how do epidemiology and the available resources and the overall organization of the healthcare system affect TB services? And then also, um, I think quite importantly, how do global diagnostic algorithms apply in different settings? Um, can you just follow them right along or are there particularities to consider? And for that, um, we picked three country examples. We've got um, our colleague Trots Lidebeck here um, from um, Copenhagen in Denmark. Then we've got our colleague Natalia from um, Georgia here, and then myself speaking for Germany. And we picked these three countries because um, while at least Denmark and Germany are close to each other, the system is organized quite differently. Uh, differently. And we thought it might be um, interesting for um, you as an audience to just see just how different TB care can be in different countries. Um, Right, and then um, after um, that, um, we will have um, enough time, I think, for, for a discussion, exchange of ideas, best practices, and your thoughts on how you are organized in your countries. So with that, um, what I would like to do is I would like, as an introduction, just sort of highlight two big, um, big topics we touched upon already. And the one thing is certainly um, the change in epidemiology we see, both globally and in Europe, and the different epidemiologies of TB we have in different parts of the WHO Euro region. And then um, we would, um, I, will, I will just give you a bit of background on the um, diagnostic algorithms that have recently been extensively 
um, consolidated and reworked um, by the headquarters of WHO in Geneva. So with regards to the epidemiology, I think a couple of things are just important to acknowledge. And as I'm sure many of you know, what we do see globally is a decline in TB. Um, and um, if you just look very broadly, um, but there are some things, um, you know, that um, we must consider and, and, um, and also in the WHO um, European region that kind of um, put at risk what we hope to achieve by the year of 2030. So and this is also from the Global TB report um, issued by WHO. And what you see here is um, in blue, the countries that had comparably low um, incidence rates for TB. Um, and if you look at Europe, um, pretty much the whole part, um, Western part of the European region is, can be considered a low incidence country. Um, so, if you look further, um, and if you look, if you further zoom down on the um, on the national level, you also see the same. You make the same observation in the um, in the um, um, European data that has been released by ECDC and by the WHO Europe, um, and you see that numbers of TB incidence rates are going down um, in almost all European countries between 2015 and 2019. Um, <clears throat> so that, that is certainly um, a positive trend and, and um, th something that went you know, quite well, I would say in the European region so far. However, on the other hand, you do see that um, also in the European region, we do have quite a challenge when it comes to multi-drug resistant and rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. And um, many um, TB patients who have been treated previously for TB then return and, and if they require um, um, another round of treatment, um, develop resistance um, um, and, and even MDR TB. So, so at the same time, we do have quite different scenarios happening within Europe. And, 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 and this is certainly sort of the one topic um, that we would just like to, to, to shed some light on on a country level. Um, epidemiology has also, um, there's a new edge coming into this um, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and that affects both treatment of TB and also diagnostics. Um, so in um, this, these are some new data by WHO where you can see that um, in the second quarter of 2020, um, as compared to 2019, the number of patients that have been enrolled in, in programmatic MDRTB treatment um, programs has declined by 33%, which is quite a significant number. So, um, so um, you see this on the therapeutic side, and um, you also see this on the diagnostic side. Um, this is a survey we did amongst the directors of the National Reference Laboratories all across the WHO European region. And, um, and what you see here is that almost all of them reported um, declines in um, TB samples received. This is what you see on the left-hand side here. Um, I think it, it was close to 90% of these laboratories um, reporting declines in TB sample numbers since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then if you look on the right-hand side, what you see is that almost 50% of the laboratories usually dealing with reference TB diagnostics have been re um, allocating resources to COVID testing. And um, so in essence, um, doing do two jobs at the same time. So, um, so both on the therapeutic side and on the diagnostic side, um, COVID-19 has again impacted the epidemiology of TB and required a response by countries. Um, and, and I think this is also quite interesting to look at um, throughout our talk today. So the second thing I wanted to mention, just as an introduction, I pointed it out already, is um, the applicability of diagnostic algorithms. And there are many algorithms around, um, both national algorithms um, by different, also algorithms by different stakeholders, and perhaps the most global um, 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 diagnostic algorithms we have are the ones issued by um, WHO headquarters in Geneva. And these diagnostic algorithms are embedded in, in sort of a larger work um, that 
tries or aims to consolidate therapeutic guidance and also diagnostic guidance for TB um, under the umbrella of WHO in these four modules that you see in front of yourselves here covering prevention, screening, diagnostics, and treatment. So what we'll do is we'll focus on the green ones, um, the diagnostic um, guidelines. And I won't go into much detail here just for the sake of time, but I think also as an introduction to what you will hear in the next um, um, hour or so, um, I just want to point out a, um, some important uh, things that that are that, that you should keep in mind. So this is sort of the most general algorithm you will find in these WHO documents. And um, I think one, one important point to to realize is that um, any person to be evaluated for TB here should um, first receive what is called an MWRD. So that's a bit of a um, um, complicated abbreviation, which means a molecular WHO recommended diagnostic test. So I uh, practice quite a bit to get that one right. Um, and in essence, what that means is that WHO defined um, a set of and 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 an tests that that fulfill this criteria and that are basically endorsed as being you know having a, a position here in this algorithm. Now, what are these tests? These tests are first uh, of all um, the gene expert system, which I think many of you are familiar with, and then also um, a second PCR based system by um, from an Indian company called Molbio. That's the TrueNut system, and then there are two um, others. One is um, the um, um, the TB lamp assay, um, which does not predict drug resistance, um, but only TB yes and no. And then um, the line probe assays. However, in the context of this algorithm, WHO um, in the footnote three um, explicitly mentions expert Molbio and the uh, TB lamp um, PCR. So the important thing to, to consider here is that the PCR or the molecular test basically um, st stands in a position where you, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, you would have probably found a microscopy. And, and so, so one important thing to, to realize here is the idea to, um, to promote molecular diagnostics because of their um, higher sensitivity to detect mycobacterium tuberculosis as compared to smear microscopy. And then from there on, it goes on, um, and I won't go through anything in great detail here, but basically the algorithm then outlines what to do in case the PCR is negative, what to do in case you find rifampicin resistance, like the expert can detect, or also the Molbio system, and so on. So, um, so that is basically the, the, the idea, and then um, this is further differentiated into different scenarios. I just brought this one along here as a highlight um, on what to do in case you find a rifampicin resistant or MDR-TB um, um, positive, PCR positive um, um, person. And then it basically goes on with collecting additional specimens, testing for fluoroquinolone resistance, conducting a culture, and then going on from there. So I think the second aspect is to figure out whether, um, whether this implies and, and can be um, implemented as it stands in different epidemiological settings um, across Europe. So, so I think these are the two sort of big bubbles I wanted to, to um, raise before. And with that, what, what we thought we would do now is that we'll get um, a couple of country examples. And the first one being Trolls from Copenhagen. And with that, um, I'd like to um, give um, the microphone over to you, Trolls. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Florian, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, also, I'll just briefly say thank you to European Society of Mycobacteriology for organizing these web webinars, for Beckton Dickinson for sponsoring them without any influence on the content, and for my two co-speakers for participating, and Matthias for, for leading. If you go to the next one. Uh, Denmark is the first country example, uh, and actually Denmark is a uh, rich country, you could say resource rich country. If we, if you take the gross domestic product, we are the nine richest in the world. Uh, and we have a tax paid public health system with free uh, access to healthcare. We are also the second happiest country in the world, maybe because of the free access to healthcare. So we have free 
TB screening, free diagnostics, uh, free treatment. Uh, and I'm sure we're also happy because we have a centralized TB laboratory service. So we have one laboratory uh, servicing the whole country. Now I'm saying the whole country compared to Germany and probably also Georgia, it's not that bigger country actually it's like 400 kilometers from one end to the other and it's a uh, 5.6 million inhabitants so so it's like a smaller german province likely but still there is some distances in in the country and finally we have a very low uh, tb overall tb incident in, incidents if you go to the next one uh, here you can see the total incidence, it's in black, and you can see that it has uh, declined most of the time. There are small fluctuations, which are mainly contributed by, uh, by foreign-born cases. It's uh, foreigners coming from areas in the world with a high incidence of tuberculosis who develop tuberculosis. So, for instance, you see a peak between 95 and 2001. I think that was ex-Yugoslavia uh, refugees from that part of the world. If you look at the Danish-born part of the curve, you can see that it is slowly declining over all the years, the number of cases. So the setting is that two thirds of the cases are foreign-born cases in, in Denmark. I guess it's the same in many of our nor neighboring country and what one third is uh, Danish-born cases. Uh, and there is very limited transmission between uh, nationalities in the country. If you go to the next one, please. It's the same uh, when it comes to resistance. We also have a low incidence of drug resistance. You can see we have two to three in total number of MDR cases per year. One year we had six cases. That would be the record, overall record. So that is really nothing compared to many other countries. It's less than 1% if you know that we have about 300 culture verified cases per year. And we have had in total two XDR TB patients. So, so that is very insignificant. However, they, they were extraordinarily resistant and difficult to treat, uh, but, but it's not something that really dominates uh, Denmark and our setting. But, but what we do have is that we do have some isoniazid resistance, two to 5%. It, it used to be five now, at the moment it's down to 2%. And, and that is perhaps not only a Danish problem. If you look at at the figure, you can see that uh, in, in many parts of the world, you have from, let's say, 40 orange up to 20% of isoniazid resistance. So, so in our setting, we do not really have to look a lot for uh, MDR and XDR TB, but we would like to, to find isoniazid resistance in whatever diagnostic uh, uh, system we use. And I'll return to that. And if you take the next one, uh, I mentioned the centralized system in Denmark. You can actually see at the right-hand side, you can see State and Serum Institute uh, it was uh, uh, starting its services in 1907. And we started diagnostics, not me personally, but we started diagnostics in 1910. So we've actually done like 110 years of diagnostics at, at uh, State and Serum Institute. Every year we receive about 40,000 specimens. This is the centralized system. We, we receive 40,000 specimens. 15,000 of those, they are EGRA tests, quantiferent tests that we do at this place. We, we run it on a daily basis uh, and reply as soon as we have the result. So the other 25,000, they are actually primary specimens that I examined for mycobacteria. And we still do microscopy. You mentioned it, Flora, and it is actually still done microscopy and it makes sense. I'll explain that later. We do also uh, culture for the, on the same 25,000 specimens we do microscopy, we do culture, both liquid and solid, and we do different PCR DNA-based methods. We don't just do one method. method. Often when you say PCR, you think of GeneXpert or some one specific PCR system, but, but we do use many different ones in the diagnostic flow. And then, of course, we also do whole genome sequencing, uh, look at molecular epidemiology, and also for, for surveillance of, of disease. Uh, the next point is actually quite important. If we look at the last 30 years, you can see that we have done 600,000 cultures, actually 600, 625,000 if you want the correct figure. And among those, we find 5,500 unique TB patients. That's individual patients with a positive M tuberculosis culture. It, it's actually complex, but 99% would be M tuberculosis. But note the next figure, we also found 4,000 NTM 
patients. So approximately one third of the patients we find when we do mycobacteriology, uh, that, that's NTM patients. So whatever diagnostic system we have in Denmark, we need to look for NTM as well as tuberculosis. It's not, some of them were suspected for tuberculosis. They could be older patients with chronic lung disease, but what they end up is, is perhaps a mycobacterium avium or something, something else. So that should certainly be taken into account. If you take the next one, I also had a problem learning this molecular VRD. Uh, I think the point is it could also be a rapid diagnostics molecular. It's some kind of PCR DNA based system. And you look for mycobacterium tuberculosis at the entry point. So that's a kind of the main entrance uh, when you do use uh, the WHO al algorithm. And if you take the next one, so based on what I just told you, imagine we in Denmark, now we decided we need to save money, might not be a saving, but we want to save money. We just do one PCR upfront for mycobacterium tuberculosis. We'll take the most widely used one globally, the gene expert, uh, which look for rifampicin resistance. Well, uh, now you know that we would miss the 40% NTM cases every year. We, we would miss the Isoniazid resistance between two and 5%. You saw other countries in Europe up to, to 20% isoniazid resistance. That would actually also mean that in the intensive phase, the first two months, we would give four drug treatment. That might work well, even though you're isoniazid resistant. In the continuation phase, if we didn't do anything else, uh, we'll assume it's fully susceptible and we'd give two drugs. But if it's isoniazid resistant, it would be rifampicin monotherapy. So I'd be concerned if you have a diagnostic uh, system where you don't look for isoniazid uh, resistance, especially if you are in an area where that's an important problem or, or that's a significant number of cases. And then, of course, if we don't have DNA, we cannot genotype and do all that kind of surveillance. So in Denmark, in our setting and in other similar settings, you need to combine the, the WHO algorithm with something else. And if you go to the next slide, please. This is actually what we do. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the different systems we use. I think the important part is not the specific name, trade name, but it is that you use a, 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 a approved system and you do it in a uh, uh, um, accredited quality assured way where you also have external quality assurance. So you know whatever results you find that they are very likely to be correct, not wrong in, in the interest of the patient, of course. So in Denmark, diagnostics would be a combination of microscopy, PCR, DNA-based methods. That's all the different red ones you find on the right-hand side. And then also culturing. So we, we do still uh, do microscopy. Um, we, we use it still for to determine infectiousness. And also we use it to see if it's microscopy positive PCR negative for M tuberculosis. We already have a clue that it might be non-tuberculous mycobacteria. We use the dis different PCR systems uh, based on the algorithm uh, go in a different direction. I'll show you it uh, in, uh, very soon. And then we also culture because we still need, to, we, it's important still for the sensitivity. It is more sensitive, especially on extra pulmonary specimens, especially on pleura, pericardial fluid on some of the different specimens we, we receive, but also to grow the difficult, the rare NTMs to do phenotypic DST, uh, especially for second line drugs, if we have resistance toward first line drugs and also for surveillance. And if you take the next one, this is actually what's done in Denmark for, for the 25,000 specimens we receive. It's recommended to send one, or sorry, three specimens per patient, ideally three specimens per patient. And that would of course be respiratory specimens. It would not be brain biopsies or liver biopsies or anything like that. Uh, then, then you would send one specimen, um, uh, but, but three respiratory specimens. If it's microscopy positive on the top left, then, then we do a PCR for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, including both isoniazid and rifampicin genotypic uh, results. And if it's PCR, 
positive on the left side, it's, that means it's microscopy and PCR positive for tuberculosis complex, then we know it's mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. That would in 99% of the cases be tuberculosis in Denmark. Then we do MTPC to be sure it's tuberculosis, not bovis or Africanus, which we have like one every second year or something like that. And if it's resistant, we do DST, both culture based, and we can do SL uh, for the second line. And we will do NGS, whole genome sequencing also to look for genotypic susceptibility on, on some of the second line drugs. If it's microscopy positive, that's a second column, PCR negative for microbiome and tuberculosis complex, then we know already now that must be a non-tuberculous mycobacteria. If it's strongly positive in the microscopy, we'll do a CM on the primary material as kind of PCR for non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and we, we will end up with a result in, in, in many cases. If it's only weakly positive, microscopy positive, or only PTR uh, uh, positive, then, then, then uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, then we'll do a culture and, and then whenever there is something growing, we'll do the CMAS, we'll do NTMDI if, if we wanted, we do 16S sequencing and we do NGS if we haven't solved the species uh, beforehand. Uh, if it's microscopy negative, we'll do a PCR for mycobacterium tuberculosis. If it's positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, we, we continue in the left column, as, as I explained before. If it's both microscopy and PCR negative for M tuberculosis complex, we culture. If it gets positive, it ends up uh, going through the same uh, diagnostics frame. So everyone in Denmark have ideally three specimens, at least one, but ideally three specimens. It's always, they always have a microscopy. They always have a PCR for M tuberculosis complex, one per new patient per year, or if requested. And what, whenever we can continue in the diagnostic uh, framework, we do that to send a fast result to the clinician. And if you give me, me the next slide, you can see that actually we reply same day with microscopy result and PCR for M tuberculosis complex, including isoniazid and resistance. We run from eight morning to eight night and on Saturdays, and we run the PCR, the main PCR three times per day. So all the specimens that are collected during night uh, in Denmark and arrive in the lab six o'clock in the morning at State and Serum Institute, they are processed same day and around noon they have the results from all specimens from the day before. And those who are fortunate to live on Sealand, where State and Sim Institute are, are situated, they can send specimens during all day and we will catch them whenever they arrive and they will have a reply if it's, if it's uh, important within two hours, otherwise within four hours for, for our normal PCR uh, procedure. Next, please. If it's uh, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, some are caught in the CM within a, f uh, within a few days, they have the result. You can see some of the species that are covered by the CM. Uh, some are covered by high in LTMDR, that's the uh, maize complex and the abscessus complex. And finally, the very rare ones we find in the end by whole genome sequencing or, or 16S. Uh, and if you give me the next slide, please. I think uh, the future, we will do even more whole genome sequence based diagnostic, especially the species ID. We, we look at whether that could replace some of the line probe assay we do. Also drug susceptibility testing, uh, if we have any resistance towards, for instance, niacinamide and rifampicin, we would immediately do whole genome sequencing and look look in the online databases for for any additional resistance. So, and we do sort of use it, of course, for molecular epidemiology. So, we are moving more and more in in that direction. Next, please. So, in conclusion. The most important is actually not on the slide. It is one size does not fit all. Uh, you do need to know the diagnostic uh, recommendations from WHO, from Euro CDC, perhaps Euro Respiratory Society, American Thoracic Society, from what I would call reliable sources. It's important to know the recommendations, but you need to adapt it to, to the national situation uh, in the country high burden, low burden, high resistant, much isoniazid resistant, much MDR resistant, low resistance. Also NTM, you certainly need to take into account the NTM situation in the country. You, you need to know it because if you don't know it or look for it, you won't know that you have a problem. So, so, so you need to know that and whatever system you use, 
need to take into account such things. The good thing about the centralized structure in Denmark, it's uh, easy to implement new diagnostics. We have like a concilium where we, we say we, we think of, for instance, introducing the, the Fujilam test, would that be a good idea? And if we agree with the clinicians, we just do it. And it's all done in a quality assured system with external quality assurance and ISO 15025 15, accreditation, they're different systems, but everything is uh, under external quality assurance. Uh, it's important also that whatever system you have is cost effective. The PCR system we use, for instance, it call what, cost one tenth of the most widely used system in the world. We do 15,000 PCR per year. Can you imagine if I had to multiply that by 10, uh, my, my um, economical department at the Satan Serum Institute would, wouldn't like us to change based on, on that. And it would also not be economically wise. Uh, we still need culture for sure. I, I've already explained why it's important with the culturing. Uh, we are moving in the direction of whole genome sequencing, but, but we are not there yet uh, and it will take years before we can do that directly on primary specimens. I think we will need to screen anyhow and find those that are positive before we apply the more expensive systems. Um, so um, if you could take the next one, please. Just to say thank you, we, we have many uh, uh, persons supporting and sponsoring different research development projects. And the next one, please. Stay safe out there. I really look forward to see you in real life. Uh, there's a small problem with the virus. It's not uh, as interesting as tuberculosis, but it is causing some problems. Uh, stay safe and thank you. We can take questions after the last presentation. Great, thanks a lot, um, Trolls, so far. So without further ado, I would um, like to pass over to um, our colleague and friend Nata from Georgia, uh, who will certainly have a a very different perspective um, in terms of the way the system is organized in terms of TB incidents and all these kinds of things. So um, Nata, over to you. Happy to hear your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Dear Florian, thank you for the introduction. And I would like to tell you a little bit about Georgia and our situation with TB and uh, also accessibility of TB diagnosis and treatment in our country. So on this picture, uh, you can see our National Reference Laboratory, new building, who was, it's, it's quite a quite new building and it is uh, very well equipped, though it's not as uh, finally well equipped as Trolls <laughs> Laboratory. So next, please. Uh, Georgia is not a big country. You know, we have uh, about three and a half million of population. We have two laboratories. One is National uh, Reference Laboratory, where we have Culture, DST, uh, Line Probe, say, and Gene Expert. And also we have one culture laboratory in the Western Georgia, in Kutaisi, it's the center of Western Georgia. And they are sending cultures for DST to the National Reference Lab in Tbilisi. And also we have um, uh, small uh, TB laboratories all over the country and they are collecting specimens, sending them for culture, doing gene expert in place in the point of care and then sending the samples for culture to Kutaisi or to Tbilisi laboratory, depending on the geographical location of these small laboratories. Uh, so uh, here on this slide, you can see that we are WHO Euro region high priority country, which means that we, are not, we don't have any more very high incidence, but still it's not uh, low enough to get rid of this high prioritization. Uh, partially decentralized means that uh, part of these small laboratories, they are under NCDC of Georgia and all gene expert network is under NCDC of Georgia surveillance. 
and cultural laboratories are under TB pro mostly under TB program. Of course, there is exchange, ex information exchange and uh, all other things. Uh, laboratories are public. Uh, we do not have private laboratories in the TB, TB network. Uh, next, please. Uh, here you can see our place in the um, European context. And uh, you, can, you can see that uh, for in 2020, we had 39 per, per 100,000. So it's, it's a significant decrease. Next slide, please. You can see here the overview since 2006 in absolute numbers until the last year. So I, I have updated the presentation with uh, the last TB report. So and next slide, please. In percentage, you can see that it's 39%. I, I fall on. Okay, in percentage we have here, yeah. Uh, and uh, you can see that we have uh, quite high retreated TB cases because it's uh, a big problem not only for Georgia but for also almost all post-Soviet countries. When we have people who come for treatment and then they give up and they are lost for follow up and then then they return back with the resistance to be so this is this is a really really big problem uh, next slide please um, here you can see this um, rif resistance and mdr TB patients who were included in treatment. And uh, the next slide, please. And uh, last year, when we had the lockdown and quarantine beginning from April, and uh, we had a significant decline in to be diagnostic, you can see it's minus 26%. Uh, for sensitive TB and uh, minus 28% for RRMDR TB. Uh, now it's less or more equal to what we had before the pandemic. Uh, next, please. Uh, here, uh, HIV and TB prevalence. You know that we have uh, both AIDS and TB programs in in Georgia, uh, which means that uh, diagnostic and treatment are funded by, by these programs. And they are uh, free for population. And uh, we have a very, very good results uh, for our AIDS program. And uh, you see how it's, it is declining. It's uh, almost half from 2000, if you compare with the numbers in 2004, we have now 1.6, which is, which is very good. Next, please. Uh, bacteriological confirmation. Mm, you know that um, this is the problem, actually, this is global problem, uh, that notified TB cases are poorly bacteriologically confirmed. We try to, did, uh, to do our best, and uh, we, we have like 90, 92% of notified TB cases with bacteriological confirmation, which means that they have either microscopy or uh, molecular tests or culture, or what, whatever we have, we are trying to do it. Next, please. Mm, uh, here are the treatment outcomes for sensitive TB of 2019 cohort. And you can see that we have quite a successful, a lot of successful treatment outcomes. It's 84%, but still we have lost to follow up and we have failures. And of course we have uh, level outcomes as well. Let's, uh, see on the next slide the treatment outcome for RRTB 
And here we have uh, less, of course, because this treatment is uh, long term and it is harder for patients. And uh, many of them, like 12%, just are lost for follow up. They give up treatment. Next, this is without XDR. And here we have XDR TB treatment again you can see. And uh, I can say that even having the, this new drug like pedecoline and lunazolid, we had clinical trials in, in Georgia and we have them included in the treatment regimens, but we already have people with uh, this new drugs resistance already. Next slide, please. Here I just uh, I will show you our algorithms. Uh, this algorithm is being updated right now according to the WHO consolidated guidelines. But you can see that everybody, all presumptive TB cases, they have a first test. Uh, this is expert. This is expert MTB or ultra. Most of our gene experts are, are ultra. And uh, uh, this uh, algorithm is in line with uh, the WHO Euro algorithm that uh, of uh, 2018, I think. Next slide, please. Uh, here is uh, a sensitive uh, follow-up uh, algorithm for sensitive patients. So we have. Uh, we take two student samples. One uh, has only microscopy. And uh, if it is positive, one of them goes for culture. And uh, it is done on the, um, on the end of month one, month two, five, and, uh, and six. And uh, then we are putting them on the culture. And uh, depending on the results, we are doing uh, SLLPA uh, hind or hind test for second line, or if it is sensitive, we do for the first line uh, phenotypic DST. Uh, next slide, please. This is for follow-up algorithm for MDRTB, and uh, you can see here how we are doing it. We are doing it on the third month of the treatment. And then if it is microscopy positive and or culture positive, we do SLLPA and uh, uh, second line DST. Next slide, please. Uh, and also we have extrapulmonary TB diagnostic algorithm. We, are, we have uh, clinical facilities. Uh, and uh, we are taking like spinal fluid, lymph node, uh, puncture, tissue samples, uh, bronchoanvolella lavage, pleurisy puncture, acetic fluid, pericardic fluid, urine, stool, whatever. Whatever. And uh, we are doing at the same time gene expert and uh, microscopy and culture. And then we are doing first line, line probe assay, just to find out what kind of resistance we have. And then uh, depending on the results, we are doing second line, uh, line probe assay to, to give a right direction. Then when we have uh, phenotypic DST results, we can correct treatment because uh, you know that uh, phenotypic DST, of course, has more uh, possibilities than, than any molecular that we have for now. We don't do whole ge genome sequencing uh, for routinely because uh, we don't have these uh, possibilities. Uh, kind of, it, it is expensive. Uh, of course, we can buy this sequencing machine, but then you have to maintain it, you have to buy reagents, and uh, it's quite problematic. So we can do this for, uh, kind of uh, within the frames of a research. This is okay, and uh, 
uh, actually, uh, or we can send to our reference laboratory, which is in Antwerp, Belgium, and uh, ask them to confirm or to exclude whatever resistance we have. Next slide, please. So about the national response, how is about the accessibility and treatment? Next slide, please. So we have a, a special group, guidelines development group, which monitors all the new guidances uh, of uh, WHO headquarters or European region, and then we uh, like translate them, adopt them for our country, and uh, all all doctors in Georgia who work with tuberculosis, they are obliged to use these guidelines. It is absolutely excluded that somebody will just uh, you know. Uh, do improvisations on the treatment regimen or the, diagno the diagnostics of TB. Next, please. Uh, we have um, uh, total access to TB diagnostics in Georgia, and it is uh, funded partially by the government of Georgia and the Global Fund. You know that Global Fund did uh, everything for the country like ours to give this possibility to our population. And uh, if in the beginning it was kind 90% of funding went from global and 10% uh, from governments, now it is vice versa. And uh, uh, for this uh, last several years, we can say that 90% are funded by a budget of Georgia and only 10% is funded by global fund. And you can see here that uh, gene expert uh, investigations uh, are funded by global fund. No, they, they are expensive. Uh, first line LPA for all uh, AFB positives and uh, second line LPA uh, are uh, funded by both government and global fund. Uh, TB culture, uh, we have midget and we have uh, LG as well, uh, but LG is mostly as a backup uh, medium because we, uh, for, for DST, for example, we almost don't use LG, we use only midget. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, second and uh, first and second line, dry, uh, dr line drugs, uh, phenotypic DST are funded by Global Fund and smear microscopy for all presumptive TB cases are uh, funded by um, uh, government of uh, uh, Georgia. Also, we have strategy, uh, strategy FAST, which is find, actively separate and treat. And it is also funded by both uh, government of Georgia and Global Fund. Spurum transportation. Uh, we have the whole uh, system uh, elaborated for spurum transportation. Now it is executed by Georgian Postal Services and uh, fully covered by the state budget. Next slide, please. Mm, drug supply and distribution. Uh, you can see that 100% uh, of the first line uh, antitypic drugs are uh, covered by government of Georgia and procured through Global Fund. And 80% of the second line drugs uh, and repurposed anti-TB drugs procured by government with 20% co-financed by the Global Fund. And uh, also Global Fund uh, supports the distribution of medicines to regions because all the drugs are centrally stocked at the NCTLD. We have a warehouse and it is uh, well ventilated and temperature regimen or whatever is needed for it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, 
we have not not only a microbacteriology lab, but also we have for clinical and biochemistry tests like uh, IOT, AFT, bilirubin, all this uh, uh, biochemistry for uh, blood. Also, we have serology. And also we have uh, instrumentals because our center is a TB and lung disease center. So we have all the set for the instruments just to find out what's happening with our patients. Next slide, please. Uh, we uh, use patient-centered approach and uh, we of course are strengthening outpatient model of care. And for this purpose, <laughs> With the support of the Global Fund, uh, our program launched a video DO, uh, DOT, uh, so-called VOT, an innovative approach directly observed treatment. So they can, they have app, and uh, they can contact uh, DOT nurses or doctors through this. Also, we have ambulance service a mobile service and uh, we can uh, kind of distribute this uh, using cars and it's, it is good. Let's go further. Next slide, please. Uh, also, we have uh, Project ECHO and uh, uh, because we have con MDR, con MDR TV Concilium so when we have patient and uh, the patient should be given this treatment for MDR-TB, we have concilium and you can see the photos from this concilium and they have telecommunication and they decide together what kind of treatment uh, needs this patient and how to, to proceed with them. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, we also, our TB program uh, is strengthening outpatient model of care and, uh, and our patients receive uh, psychological support from treatment adherence consultants. And uh, since 2008, uh, we reimburse them transportation costs for each accomplished DOT visit. And uh, all TB patients uh, receive conditional cancer incentive for good compliance already supported by Georgian government for MDR patients. They also um, receive food packages. Next slide, please. Uh, and also we do a lot in pharmacovigilance and uh, implement, we are implementing uh, ADSM implementation and uh, we adopted this uh, serious advert event forms and uh, guidelines and uh, severity grading scale and uh, we received big help from MSF France for use it uh, all these things at the national level. Uh, yeah, and you can see on this slide that, uh, of course, uh, uh, TB Center is leading all this work, and uh, uh, we started implementation uh, of this ADSM core package in early 2016, and uh, uh, gradually moved to intermediate package, package in 2018. And we also have a ministerial decree uh, on mandatory recording and reporting of these serious advert, uh, advert events uh, forms for all drug resistance to be patients. And uh, our state regulation agency for medical activities uh, became a full member of the WHO collaborating Uppsala Monitoring Center. Next slide, please. Uh, in the last uh, 2019 compendium, compendium of Good Practices by WHO, we had submitted six best practices from Georgia, and you can see that it is used of GeneXpert as a primary test for diagnosis of takeoff TB and introduction of new types of DOT in Georgia, implementation of fast strategy, implementation of WHO framework for active TB drug safety monitoring, 
and TB Echo project and building clinical research capacity. And uh, we hope that in next continuum we will have six or more. <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, of course, and, uh, nothing is perfect, you know, and uh, we have challenges. And uh, one of them is human resource that uh, in regions, uh, it's low motivation. And uh, mostly it's people who work in TB for many years. So uh, it, because of this low motivation, the young people, they don't want to go to the region and work in TB program. Treatment and adherence is uh, also not uh, on the good level. Uh, we have still high loss to follow up. Uh, ability uh, to, uh, to perform DST to new and repurpose drugs used in treatment regimens because it ch it's changes very fast and uh, we also need, need more resources and more effort to implement this. DSTs. For now, we we have everything, but we don't. We, you never know. Tomorrow you will have new drug, and you have to adopt your laboratory service again. Uh, Wake referral practices from the public health level. Uh, this is also one of the problems because maybe a lack of uh, communications between the TB program and other doctors. We need to work at it. Uh, continuous training on TB program staff. Uh, this also needs resource. Designing and implementing of unique TB national database, which is very important to have the unique database for the whole country and with co communication with the AIDS program and other medical programs functioning in Georgia. TB law, also very important. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the challenges from the last year when we faced lack of respirators, especially in regions need of increased financial support for infectious control in clinical facilities and intensive therapy departments. Essentially, it, it became very obvious during this COVID pandemic, you know, it's kind of revealed all the wet links. Uh, many TB facilities were not working because of quarantine and uh, referral didn't work well. In this case, so this is why we have decrease in 26, 28%. Um, monthly provision on after TB, uh, anti TB drugs decreased uh, to minimize the risk of COVID because you need to give this uh, to be in contact. And also because of the lockdown in India, some first line drugs provision uh, were expected to be delayed. Next slide, please. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention and <laughs> over to you. Florian. Great, thanks a lot, Nata, for this um, snapshot from uh, how things are going in Georgia. So to wrap it up, um, I thought I'd present you or give you an idea of how we organize TB care in Germany and, and sort of the particularities we have in Germany, of which there are quite a few. So I guess we've seen with Trold's presentation and Nata's presentation, um, two country examples with different incidences really, but but where, where there's a strong um, central um, aspect to it in terms of funding sources, in terms of the way the system is organized. And I think Germany is a quite a nice contrast to that in a sense that it works quite differently really in Germany. So Germany is a country with a low TB incidence. I will show you the numbers. And TB services are to a large extent fairly decentralized, I would say. So there's no sort of strong national TB program which has the authority to say how things are being done, um, but it's much more decentralized, much more market driven also um, within the framework of national guidelines. Um, 
a, a, a particularity of Germany is that we have actually not only one healthcare system, but two. Uh, one is the statutory, so the, the public system, and one is the private system. And depending on the, um, the income, and there are certain income levels um, from which, and, and, and certain other criteria from which a patient can actually decide whether he wants to be insured under state or, or under private um, regulations. So that coexists and it coexists with two different reimbursement schemes. Um, and then we've got a, quite a heterogeneous laboratory landscape, which I will show to you in a minute. But let's go back to the to the epidemiology first. So these are the, the, the numbers for Germany. And as you can see, following the global tendency, we've had a decline in TB from the early 2000s all the way up to 2013, 14, um, where we reached numbers similar to what we've heard from trolls in Denmark. And then um, we had a bit of a rebound here in 15, 16, that basically related to um, a large influx of um, refugees and people seeking asylum um, from, um, from Africa, but also from the Eastern Mediterranean region, from Afghanistan, um, which was um, um, quite um, significant during these years. And then uh, following that, that sort of um, declined again. And now um, these are also the latest numbers, including 2020, we've seen um, a number of recorded or, or um, um, notified TB cases, um, that is a new minimum with five per 100,000 in 2020, which is certainly influenced by the COVID pandemic. So, I mean, from this, these numbers alone, you can already see that there, there, are, there are quite um, a couple of challenges in our setting. So basically to complement what, what also Trolls reported in NATA, we've got approximately 100 MDR TB cases in Germany. So it's more than in Denmark, but it's 88 million population. And it's still a number that you can actually study in, in detail. So it's, it's not a thousands of MDRs, but it's it's a hundred, and you, you, you it's still worthwhile to um, to study them in great detail. Um, and then, depending on the year, some some something between one and, and ten XDRs. So the challenge, the first challenge that is derived from this is the challenge really to stay proficient. Um, so with TB becoming less prevalent, um, you really have a challenge in a, in a um, country like Germany um, to make sure that the, when a TB patient shows up in a hospital, you actually have um, people around who have experience in treating TB, particularly in treating drug-resistant TB. And the same holds true for the laboratory side, similar to what Nata also reported from, jo from Georgia. But um, um, I, well, perhaps one of the good things about the COVID-19 pandemic, if there are any, is that it raised an interest in infectious diseases and hopefully also with the young medical colleagues, um, you know, developing a new interest in, in infectious disease diagnostics as well. So the other challenge is to, to change the diagnostic infrastructure um, as a response to these declining numbers in a smart way. And I will give you the numbers in a couple of slides. And then one, one other important aspect coming back to the testing is, and I think that's an important takeaway from today's session as well, is that working in a low incidence country, it's really important when it comes to implementing new diagnostic tests to check based on which data evaluations of these tests were published. So because it is basic statistics that um, um, predictive values depend on the prevalence in the general population you test. So if you have a test whose performance characteristics have been established using high incidence setting data or, or an over-representation even in, enriched for drug resistant strains, then you need to be very cautious in interpreting these data for a low incidence setting. So, so that is certainly something that, that, um, that uh, we need to keep an eye on um, over here. And then um, to make the connection again to Trolls um, presentation, um, NTM, same, same story in Germany. What you see here on the left-hand side is the number of reported NTM cases um, based on um, ICD-10 
codes in the doctor's letters after all, because you, you can, it's difficult to study this from a lab perspective because NTM infections are not notifiable. So, so you can't just go to the public health service and compare the TB notifications to the NTM notifications, but you'll need to have some surrogate. Um, and usually what people do is they look at what has been encoded um, in the, in the during the hospital stay. However, and, and, and there are two important things to acknowledge here. So first of all, in certain age groups, NTMs are a larger problem in Germany than TB. The red horizontal line is the five per 100,000 um, TB incidents. And the second thing to acknowledge is that um, in my experience, the, there's quite a bit of dark matter out there when it comes to the work associated with NTM that is not reflected in any statistics. So in TB, in, un, unless you have some crazy constellation, usually if you find mycobacterium tuberculosis in a patient's lungs, it's identical to the need to treat it. However, if you look at the data here, you see that these are the patients that have been diagnosed with NTM pulmonary disease, but there are countless calls uh, in, in our laboratory where we have to work out whether the patient is actually sick at all to begin with, and that never ends up in any statistics. So the amount of work, and that's what I'm trying to say, we have with non-tuberculous microbacteria is certainly much larger than what we, what we see here in the numbers. And also just corroborating um, Joel's point on the right-hand side, we also have to have an algorithm in place where we look for NTM. The second point, and I'm sorry for the busy slide, but the second point I wanted to raise is um, um, intermediate or medium and high throughput test platforms. So what, what I brought along here on the left-hand side is from the WHO manual, and it basically shows the, w, the MWRD, so the um, endorsed diagnostic tests and their characteristics. And um, you see again here, uh, they did the numbers and you see the connection between prevalence and, and test performance. The point I brought it along is because the way the system is organized in Germany is that we have quite a um, substantial number of, first of all, private laboratories and then also large laboratories, which try to use diagnostic platforms that meet their throughput. And um, both the expert and the true nut system are not high throughput systems. So um, um, if you see and look at an instrument, for instance, like the Cobas system from, from Roche, which is really a high throughput PCR machine that is used in for, for hematologies, blood bank screening, hepatitis PCRs, and recently COVID high throughput PCRs. Um, um, th these are instruments that are placed in quite a few labs in Germany. Same holds true for the BDMAX, which I would call a medium throughput platform, the Abbott system and others. And so um, these instruments that are, are in the labs and people want to use it. So at this point, we need to take a step away from the WHO algorithm as it currently stands. However, one has to say that there is um, now, I think, um, work going on also within WHO to, to study these, um, these medium and high throughput tests. Um, and I brought you along the relevant document. I won't go into any great detail here for the sake of time, but I think we will expect, uh, we can expect to see um, diagnostic um, or, or these medium and high throughput platforms sort of finding their way into the the global algorithms um, as well for laboratories to just have a larger choice of tests that better fit their, um, their local needs. And then the second point that is, I think, quite particular to Germany is, is um, um, the, the, um, the sheer amount of laboratories involved in TB care. And that is a, a work that we did in, in a couple of years ago, but that's the most recent data we have. So I, I decided to, br to bring it along anyway. Um, we basically asked participants in our external quality assurance scheme. Um, I, I guess it's probably one of the largest in the world um, that we run for mycobacteria. Um, and we asked them what laboratories that participate in this scheme actually do. And we received 170 responses from Germany, which is I think already by itself quite an interesting number. Um, and as you see, there's quite a heterogeneous mix between the different, um, the different um, um, laboratory categories. 
But what I'd really like to show you is this slide here, um, where you can see that in Germany, the bottom line is that we have one reference laboratory, um, a national reference laboratory, which is our own. And um, we have a second large um, specialized laboratory um, in the south of Germany, both of which are supranational reference labs. And we've got 96 laboratories in Germany that actually perform primary culture for TB. Um, moreover, we have um, and I think that, that is quite an interesting number as well. There are 38 laboratories in Germany that perform phenotypic first-line testing and um, six laboratories that perform phenotypic second-line DST. Uh, keep in mind that we have 100 MDRTBs in Germany and there's, I think it's fair to say that most of these MDRs are handled um, by, the, by the reference lab um, sooner or later. So if you look at the numbers in terms of total specimen uh, numbers tested for mycobacteria, you, see, you also see it's quite a heterogeneous distribution reaching from over almost 40,000 to close to zero. Um, and if you go further, um, you can also see these are the num these are the laboratories that perform first line drug susceptibility testing. The numbers are quite heterogeneous. The red lines I drew here, I think the upper one is even from the German recommendation, the minimum recommendation, um, but certainly the lower one is um, I pulled out of the US recommendation, which says you should do at least 50 DSTs per year to, to remain proficient. Um, Looking at the molecular testing with such an heterogeneous system, it's actually more or less expected that the adopt the rate of adoption of new new um, recommendations, similar to what Nata pointed out in her talk, is not equally quick um, um, everywhere. So uh, back then we had uh, fifty only forty five percent of the laboratories that performed micro microscopy doing fluorescence microscopy, which is known to be more sensitive. And we only had 73% of the respondents performing a molecular test, such as the gene expert, which is um, not really close to a hundred percent. So so um, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity and um, that comes with, with advantages and disadvantages. Maybe so, and, 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 and also from that point of view, there's not this one diagnostic algorithm that I can present on how things are being to be done in Germany um, because it's really a market driven system. There are certain um, um, recommendations in place, um, both international, but also national recommendations on testing to be done. And if you boil it down into sort of the classic diagnostic workflow, it would probably look something like this, what we see here. So, you know, you would want to have a microscopy result in 24 hours. Um, that could be in a peripheral laboratory, that could be in a central laboratory, that would hopefully be fluorescence microscopy. And then hopefully you would also have close to the patient a molecular test that answers the question of TB, yes and no, and that at least answers the question of rifampicin resistance, although it would be desirable just like in Denmark and probably also in Georgia to have um, um, detection for INH resistance in place broadly um, as well. But that's not the case um, as of now. And then if you find a resistant um, strain, you would, um, you would try to do the, um, the, the, the second line workup, which classically consists of doing um, line probe assays. That is certainly not something that is being done peripherally, so, you know, the, the, the sample would have to be sent somewhere, which comes at the price of uh, delay in, in the due to transport. Um, and then also the essays are not really um, um, giving you all the information you need anymore with regard to the new definitions of MDR tuberculosis. So um, it is still important to learn about quinolone resistance, but much more important now then learning about aminoglycoside resistance is to learn about bedaquiline resistance. And like Nata reported, um, we also had, um, I think now 10 or 12 patients with acquired bedaquiline resistance um, described in Germany. Um, so, so that's what you want to know. And it's not possible to obtain this information um, with a line probe assay as of now. 
And then um, a couple of weeks later, you would get the culture result. You would do the phenotypic DST either on site or by forwarding it to um, a larger laboratory. And then classically typing has been done with Miru and VNTR. So, so the, the way we're trying to work um, um, and, and as a reference laboratory, we're trying to drive it and, and, and sort of um, um, you know, um, implement that in, in the German scene would perhaps look something like this. So that's what I call um, the next generation diagnostics in Germany. And, and um, you would, so you basically, you would still have the microscopy as a rapid test. Um, for the same reason that trolls gave you, um, looking for NTM, also looking for fulfilling hospital hygiene requirements um, and these kinds of things. But you would certainly want a PCR that covers both rifampicin and isoniazid. And that could be in a reference lab, but that could also be, and that should also be in the peripheral lab that, that works on TB care. And then um, um, if you find a resistant um, 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 uh, or, or if you have a primary specimen that sh shows um, um, where, you, where, you, where, you, where you find drug-resistant TB, um, nucleic acids, um, we would nowadays also try to push for next generation sequencing, um, either by trying to get whole genome sequencing working from primary specimens, which is a difficult task, or, and that's sort of the other um, line of thinking we're currently following by, um, by implementing targeted NGS, where the, where, the, where the difference is that it contains an amplification step like in a multiplex PCR before sequencing. Um, and then you only sequence the genes that are relevant for drug resistance. And we see quite promising results for that one, um, which has the advantage that you also get information on bedaquiline and on linezolid alongside the quinolones. It would also facilitate um, um, diagnosing heteroresistance and you get a preliminary idea of the, um, of the um, spoligo type. And then again, a couple of weeks later, unfortunately difficult to accelerate that, you would get the positive culture, you would do the phenotypic DST, perhaps in a more centralized way so that the numbers just are high enough to remain proficient. Um, and then we would um, go into whole genome sequencing, um, both for to confirm molecularly the drug susceptibility testing and then also to do the surveillance. And, and on that end, we're quite fortunate now that uh, we um, received funding from the um, um, federal administration to now sequence every new TB um, culture in Germany, irrespective of the drug susceptibility pattern. So that's an, a central element, an element of centralization, which certainly makes sense um, from the from the point that we can channel all these genomes through the same pipeline um, and analyze it together with our colleagues from the Public Health Institute um, in, in the same consistent way. And um, Matthias, who's also around today, um, knows a lot about it and, and our colleagues in Boston. So, so that's, that's sort of where we want to go. Um, and and um, maybe summarizing my part, um, I would say this is probably what I can share for, for the German situation. So we have a low incidence decentralized setting and the advantages of that are that usually there is a lab that does quite a lot of TB things close by. Um, however, I would put this a bit in brackets because with large private laboratory networks, samples are typically you know, shipped around Germany quite a bit um, to reach the, the core laboratory. Then perhaps um, with an eye on, on the market, um, I would say the competition creates pressure on prices. That's a natural thing. Um, and that can also be a good thing because that brings down pricing, prices we need to pay as a laboratory. Um, and then also prices that our um, um, referring doctors will have to pay for or the patients for, for their care. And the, the third thing about such a decentralized setting, um, which is probably an advantage or a good thing, is that it, there's redundancy at all levels of care. And we've seen that during COVID, where we observed, for instance, that many peripheral laboratories shifted lots of their PCR capacity towards COVID testing and then sent the primary specimens for, for TB um, to the reference laboratory, for instance. So the system is able to balance itself out um, um, a bit better. 
However, the, the disadvantages, are, as I mentioned, um, the challenges to maintain proficient, um, particularly for drug resistant TB when many players are involved. Um, it can be difficult to collect diagnostic information across all these laboratories. So if I need to um, give a therapeutic recommendation, I often have to puzzle together different pieces of information from different labs. And, and I think that's also an important connection to our today's topic. There's a limited applicability of algorithms that are primarily designed for high incidence settings with a light on NTM and on centralized high throughput testing systems. Adoption of change, some are quick, some are not so quick, um, some are too quick. So, um, so that is an element of heterogeneity. And, and we've touched on that one as well. Um, cost can be a barrier for an otherwise preferable test um, that certainly relates to next generation sequencing, for instance. So with that, um, that is sort of the idea um, I can give you for Germany. And um, with that, I would like to hand over again to Trolls for some wrap ups and summaries. And um, thank you so far. Thank you. And, and be ready to ask some questions. Uh, just to summarize, I think it's fair to conclude that one size does not fit all. We, there is not one universal global algorithm that, that would fit uh, any situation. This does not mean that they are not useful because they are useful to know and, and, and have taken time to to, to, to make and a lot of consideration, but you always need to adapt to, to the local situation. Is, is it a high burden area, low burden area, high burden NTM area, low burden NTM, high burden uh, uh, resistance area, MDR, XTR, isoniazid. You saw all the implication that has for, for the diagnostic key you use in the country to, to do diagnostics. Uh, I think we, we saw a nice, two nice example of centralized diagnostics in, in Georgia and in, in, in Denmark, but very different setting, one high MDR or higher MDR setting, one low MDR setting, uh, more retreatment cases uh, in one place, less retreatment cases in, in the other place, perhaps more in term in our country or just uh, not known for sure in, in, in the other setting. We, we saw the German situation that from an incidence point of view, and I think also MDR point of view looks like Denmark if, if you take the relative numbers, but very, very decentralized structures with, with laboratories receiving extraordinary few specimens and doing few DST per year and, and a market driven uh, system. Uh, so, so I think you, you need to know the TB NTM mycobacteria situation in, in the country. And then you have to be uh, able to, to adapt to that, that specific uh, setting and base your diagnostics and, on that. And whatever you do, do it in a quality assured system with external quality assurance. Uh, you have to participate in external quality control. So you know that you can rely on the results having the more laboratories you have, the fewer samples and see, the more important it is for them to participate in EQA. Uh, so, so that would certainly be, be very important. I think that's, that was uh, my wrap up. I think we'll go uh, for the question. Uh, Matthias will be the guide on that. I hand over to you, Matthias. Yeah, thanks, Troll. And um, also thanks to the other speakers, Florian and Natalia. It was a very comprehensive and interesting overview. Um, I was indeed um, surprised that um, apparently NTMs have almost as the same significance in, in Central Europe than, than TB has. And, and with that, um, I also want to highlight again the next talk um, on, on Thursday from Jakob van Ing about NTMs and the diagnosis of, of NTM diseases. So that will be again at two o'clock uh, Central European time and also Florian mentioned that the week after, on the 10th of June, Harald Hoffmann and Simon Tiberi have uh, another seminar about the logistics. And I indeed received some, some questions during the talks. So um, the first question that came um, for Troll actually, when, while you were introducing um, your pipeline starting from the microscopy, um, and that came from uh, Francisco Leva from the NIH. 
Um, it's about the this algorithm. Could you elaborate a bit um, about realistic timelines in your in your laboratory? So when you go from the mic po microscopy positive arm and the microscopy negative arm, so I'll be happy to do so. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if Florian, if you could share that slide. Otherwise, I can actually just mention it. Um, in, in Denmark, we, we receive specimens uh, during the day um, or, or they're collected in, in hospital settings and the outpatient clinics during the day. And then they are, yeah, that's the one, thank you. And then they are shipped during night to, to our laboratory. You have to imagine a, a smaller country where we where we can you can collect all the specimens ship them and we get them next morning early uh, we get them around eight or nine o'clock in the laboratory and then we do a pcr the pcr we do it take a little bit longer and it includes both isoniazid and rifampicin uh, it's high in fluorotype it's not a secret which pcr we use uh, and we have the result including the 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 pre-treatment, preparing specimens, registering them, everything, we have the result within four hours. So, so when we start our eight at nine o'clock, uh, they have the results at, uh, at noon or one o'clock. And, and we do that PCR three times per day. So, so the hospital situated, situated closer to state and same they actually send specimens during the day. They are collected at certain time intervals or they could even send a taxi if it's, if it's critically important. So, 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 and in that case, we will actually do a gene expert PCR, and, and then we have the results within, I think, one hour, 40 minutes, if it's negative or even faster, if it's positive. And then we'll still do all the other tests on the same material. Uh, so, so microscopy takes to do, we can do a rapid microscopy for in 20 minutes uh, 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 and, and, and phone the clinician with the results. So microscopy within an hour, a PCR four hours with the system we use or two hours if it's very urgent. And then of course, if it's microscopy negative, PCR negative for tuberculosis, uh, then we have to wait for the culture. Uh, we could try to do use a, a CM, hind CM for primary PPCR, but, but if it's microscopy negative, it never gives a, a result that's too little DNA. So, so we would uh, need for something to grow. If it's mycobacterium tuberculosis, that would typically be within two or three weeks. And then at the same moment at growth, we do all the things, all the additional things again. So, so in our setting, most things are answered same day within hours. But if you live in the other end of the country, of course, uh, you have to ship it here or it's driven during night. They can actually do a PCR or microscopy in the region, but then they have to, to divide the material and send uh, half for us. And if there is not a material, they have to send all because it was the experience that, that they did not send material uh, if, if that was not the rule. But what they've done in praxis is stop doing uh, local microscopy and PCR because they, they are, it's an acceptable time frame. Uh, so that was, I hope that was the answer to that question. Yeah, thanks. Over. The, the beauty of a centralized system, I think Florian is quite jealous about that. Um, there's no also... comment. No <laughs> but you comment. Have different, you have different distances. I, 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 I envy you every day, trolls. <laughs> Um, there's actually also, um, you mentioned, Troll, um, the, that you use a, cost, a more cost-effective PCR that also triggers some interest here from uh, Mona Lisa Mohanty, for instance. Um, she was curious um, which different PCR techniques are you using, or it's probably also a question to, to, to all speakers, which techniques are you using? And... Um, can you please also advise um, which one would be helpful to include in the routine in a resource-limited resource country? And also a later question was about um, the use of the LAMP PCR assay, if you're using that or... Maybe, yeah, maybe I can quickly comment mm. on that one and then, and then the others can, can add. So, I mean, it really depends on the unique setting and, and what what works in a reference laboratory not necessarily works in a in a more peripheral laboratory. So I don't know where uh, from where where you're exactly working in in a reference laboratory. At least we try to have almost all systems available. Um, that the reason is because we run the 
external quality assurance scheme and I would like to test every sample we send out on different systems um, and also to troubleshoot later on in case there is some issue in this EQA which is sent out to over 300 laboratories. So that is certainly a very special situation um, in the sense that we have quite a few instruments at hand and, and um, we can shift around, which is also nice in a, in, a term, in, in terms of, and that's something we didn't cover yet, in terms of, um, again, redundancy. And that's something we've seen um, um, through, through sort of the, the hourglass as part of the COVID-19 pandemic, where I'm sure many of you also struggled, for instance, with reagent supplies. And suddenly there were no commercial kits from manufacturer A available because they were stuck on a different continent and the plane didn't fly or, or these kinds of things. So, so as a general rule, I would, I, I, I would, I would try to, um, um, always have a backup plan and and therefore having more than one test available is is um, a good choice from that point of view and the other aspect is throughput because not all different systems um, 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 you know match the same requirements in terms of sample throughput so how many samples will have to be tested per day and then you will have to have different instruments that fulfill this need then um, Daniela just added um, maybe I can share that one as well um, that um, right the the platforms are endorsed by WHO and can also be considered an initial test in countries using a centralized approach. So um, that kind of follows up on what I said in that um, there's a now a, a, I think a tendency to open up the, the diagnostic menu also in terms of endorsement to cover these different platforms, to cover different needs, ranging from something like a one slot expert instrument on the one end to a Cobus 8,800 on the other hand, which can do like hundreds of PCRs, uh, hundreds of PCRs in one shift. Anything, Anata? Can, can I comment as a representative from the resource limited country? Uh, I mean that uh, when it comes to TB and we speak about PCR, uh, the main thing for us, uh, for the country with uh, really limited resources is to have WHO endorsed method to give reproducible and comparable results. Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, we can of course ask partners to give us COBAS or Roche or whatever, but we will not be using it. You know, this is, this is another, another thing. If you have it for research, for the time being, and you have the budget enough to buy all the reagent. This is one thing. When you have it for the routine and you you need, if it's not the peak of pandemic, the peak of the wave, where you when you have enough uh, patients to fill this run on this big PCR machine. So it's kind of, uh, we should adopt it, uh, uh, not adopt the country to the method, but adopt method to the country. What, what would right. be actually the, the price um, you, you would need for a molecular test to be implemented into, into the routine? Um, actually, uh, as we have uh, this experience with hind test with the LPA, right, line probe, say, uh, we, and, and with gene expert. And of course, it was done with the help with, of Global Fund and other partners. Because one box of uh, 1996 uh, tests, uh, of Hein, it's now more than one thousand five hundred dollars, guys. It's, it's uh, it is expensive, mm. and uh, to be program covers for all the patients, you know. So it's not realistic. And I had a question to Florian about this whole genome sequencing. Uh, this is wonderful. It's fantastic method. I totally agree. But what about the standardization? Because you have too too much data. You can be lost at it. Mm. There should be kind of, and you know this, uh, short runs, long runs, they are also different. And if like 
three or five years ago, uh, Illumina, MySec was, ah, and now we have next machine. And everything is changing and it is not standardized. Hmm. How are you going to compare and find out what is, what is true? So I think probably I'm not the best one to answer this question, but we're fortunate Steve, enough Steve, to, to, have Steve, Matthias, Steve. to have Matthias, to have Matthias around, who's, yeah. who's actually um, who's actually very yeah. much involved in this as well. So Matthias, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, uh, not so much about the uh, implementation costs, of course, but um, mm. I also find it quite um, it's crazy. Of course, it's kind of two different worlds, indeed. Currently, um, I mean. When you, when you come to us and we, we do a scientific collaboration, we would only charge you 30 euro for um, yeah. one whole genome sequence. But This is different. Um, yeah, but Florian, <laughs> I mean, you, you were also once a bit um, figuring out with our German health insurances what would be actually needed to um, get reimbursed for such kind of tests. And I think then you are easily in a range of 300 or, or even more Euros, yeah, and then and then the challenges in a, in a market driven system, um, there is there is not a general rule where you would say um, the national TB program says this is has this is what has to be done. End of the story. Right. But what happens in a market driven system is that the um, the laboratory or the doctor or the after all the healthcare insurance that pays for this will ask, well, you need to show me that if there are two alternative systems out there that basically give you kind of the same essential piece of information. What comes on top is a different story, but the essential piece of information that is needed to provide basic care for a patient. And once one test costs, I, I say an arbitrary number, 10 euros, and the other test costs 100 euros, mm -hmm. then it will probably not be sufficient to come up with a um, sort of scientific way of um, saying, well, this is the much cooler technique and we can do so many more things and da 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 But there has to be also a valid economic healthcare economic business case behind it. And I'm the last one who's very good at doing that, but, but I'm afraid this is what is needed in order to actually establish such a technology. It has to be competitive with the standard of care from a financial perspective as well. Yeah, because, you know, it's a reverse proportion. We have a low income population with low income and high incidence, and you have vice versa. So if in Germany, like to pay 60 euro for a test, it's okay. In Georgia, it is not okay at all because having 60 euro, you can live kind of several days and buy food to your family. And uh, this is what we, we have to think about. And another thing is, as I already said, a standardization of uh, whole genome sequencing results. What do we have? And well, there is the, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so there is there there are a lot of initiatives out there right now. Also, right the umbrella of WHO, um, and 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 I think many people who are very much involved um, in in the field. Um, hang on, I'm I'm supposed to stop the screen sharing here. Just give me one second. So I'll do that now. Um, so. So there are lots of initiatives um, in, out there to consolidate the different pipelines. And also there's recent work that, that um, has now been done that basically um, come, aimed at coming up with a consolidated catalog of mutations that we consider relevant and that we do not consider relevant and all these kinds of things. So there's, and there's a lot of um, comparative work, um, comparing um, pipelines for analysis and, and these kinds of things. So I'm sure we will see a consolidation in that um, over the next couple of, of years. And it's in part, it's already there, but there's certainly more work to be, that needs to be done. Um, so, so different labs using basically the same technology, which would be whole genome sequencing, eventually come up with the same result that is true for the patient and, um, and, um, and leads to 
hopefully a similar diagnostic recommendation. Thank you. Um, so it, it basically covered a bit the question um, from Sri Kant from India also if there are also alternatives for Lyme probe assays for countries like India. So do you want to give an additional comment to that, Trolls? Yeah. Yeah, just to, to return to, to the uh, original uh, question about PCI, I, I think the, the more laboratories you have, the more decentralized, the, the, the less uh, um, centralized, the more you need very standardized and, and like CE approved or approved methods. So, so in that situation, the, the gene expert, for instance, is, is a very nice, it's extraordinarily difficult to do it the wrong way. Uh, 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 but, but if you are not a, a, a subsidized country and we are not in Denmark, I, I just showed you, we were, we were number one on this global rich list. So, so it makes sense that we are not subsidized but it would cost me 10 times more to buy a cartridge uh, than, than to use the the system we use and and we are like a, a more specialized laboratory with 30 persons doing microbiology all the time and 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 we we do larger batches of space you know whenever we get all these specimens every morning we do a batch of of specimens and and then we collect them for the next next batch four hours later and that actually reduces the cost uh, for, for us with, with to one tenth of the price of this cartridge so 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 i think i cannot i do not want to recommend specific systems but i think you such these kind of things you should take into consideration uh, w when you adapt the diagnostic uh, system to your uh, to your laboratory and whatever you do always uh, do it in an accredited way, uh, have external quality assurance, so you are sure you can rely on the results. And that will also be extraordinarily difficult for small laboratories doing very few samples, because uh, it takes quite a lot of energy actually to, to work in an accredited, accredited environment. Uh, so, so for us to change to, 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 to this cartridge-based system, that, that would be a huge uh, cost uh, for the Danish taxpayers, for instance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe one one um, addition to the to the question on Lyme probe assays. So I mean I think there are pros and cons to Lyme probe assays really. And and I think for for a long time and, and many years now, Lyme probe assays have provided an extra, extraordinary new um, um, information content that has just not been there um, before. Um, and I think one thing that um, you know, every now and then becomes relevant is that, for instance, um, they're also suitable for having an eye on uh, hetero resistance because you see both wild type and mutant bands. Um, then, then you also have the, the, you also have a chance to pick up unfrequent mutations because the wild type band is missing, but you may not necessarily have a mutant band. So there are certainly um, a couple of things that are attractive about about line probe assays, but then on the on the on the other side, obviously it's it's a you know it requires a bit of work to perform them, um, and and there are certain limitations now as we have a shift in the relative um, importance that are, that has been given to particularly second line drugs as opposed to previous years, and there might even be a biological limitation. Um, for, for instance, detecting rifampicin, re um, sorry, bidacrylin resistance due to mutations in RVO678 um, by a line probe assay because, and, and we're starting to learn that only now, but, but um, also Matthias has done some work on that recently. And we see that the mutations are distributed um, across the whole gene. So it's difficult to design a line probe assay that actually covers that. So these kinds of things. And then you, you're, you're very quickly are in a position where you actually do really need sequencing um, if you really want to know it. And, um, and so having a replacement for line probe assays that you could use one-to-one -to, -one to kick out line probe assays and to do something else, I probably don't see it. But, um, but you would probably have to, you know, and, and you will need to do that anyway. D look at your local situation again, like we outlined before, um, and, and if it requires any changes now in terms of bidacrylin resistance, finding linezolid resistance, these kinds of things. How, how, how often is that? I would assume with the um, person from India asking the question, it's certainly something you want to 
you know you want to find and 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 so you need to have a, a method in place that probably will not be Lyme probe essay anyway when it comes to these drugs nata yeah uh, i just just one comment or whatever uh, as for Lyme probe essay and uh, uh, for uh, whole genome sequencing you need to work with infectious material. This is one more limitation. Like with GeneXpert, you, this can be uh, by safety level one, and if you have a safety hood, uh, BSC, BSC, I mean, uh, so class two, it's okay. But if you don't have your uh, infrastructure, you, you can't work with it. And, uh, also, for uh, whole genome sequencing, as I know for now, as far as I know, we need to have enough culture to extract enough DNA to do the sequencing. We do not have yet direct sequencing right in the materials. It's uh, sputum or other samples or whatever. So we need infrastructure. It is complicated. It is complicated. We have two or three sequencing machines in, in the Lugar laboratory here in Georgia. But, uh, you know, it's Lugar laboratory, BSL-3, <laughs> negative pressure. <laughs> you know, this is one more limitation for, for the country like ours. Or you have to be private laboratory, a rich private laboratory, in, capable to maintain whatever you have. Perhaps I can comment on that as well. Right. Uh, just uh, regarding the whole genome sequencing, we are actually, we, we, you could say we are a, a rather advanced uh, laboratory in a rich country. We still receive 25,000 specimens that we have to analyze for mycobacteria. So, so I, I cannot see any system in the near future where we, where we screen 25,000 primary specimens, both pulmonary and extrapulmonary with a whole genome sequencing methods, even, even if it's, uh, uh, you know, specific regions or we, we look for. So, so we, I I'm feel quite sure that we will need some kind of PCR DNA based methods to right. find those that are positive. Grow them. Food. <laughs> e even then we might based on a positive PCR, go and use the same primary specimen and do the whole genome sequencing. That could make sense, uh, saving us right. the culture, but, but, but we are not anywhere near that yet. So, so, so receiving all the primary specimens, I, I don't see us doing uh, NGS directly on the, those in the near future, because it would be so many, it would be an extraordinary high cost. So we need to screen them, and then perhaps we can do it on the positive primary uh, specimens uh, NGS uh, in the near future, but it's a very distant future to do it on every primary specimens from any kind of body location. Uh, over. Uh, there's a follow up question also in the chat um, um, with regard to the line probe assays again. So, if the 10 color XDR cartridge from Cephite, can that be an um, opportunity to replace line probe assays? Do you know that? Actually, haven't heard about that. Well, uh, so well, so the the um, oh, trolls. Do you want to take it, please? No, please do do so because it's uh, it's not really. If I understand correct, it's not really on the market. Yes, I've heard about it, but it, it's not there yet. So you might be better informed that, than me. Yeah. Also, it, uh, sorry, just just one comment. As far as I uh, know, to my understanding, let's say like this, uh, this there will be. Again, limited uh, limited quantity of genes or of uh, points of or point mutations that it will detect. I I I think that this uh, these are more all this line probe say and gene expert and something like this. It's kind of screening methods. Mm. If you catch something, you just go go mm. further. That's all. Right. Yeah. Maybe the, the, the last thing I can add to that is that, I mean, it, it's super important here to that, that laboratories work together with manufacturers. So they come up with tests that right. are actually meaningful for a diagnostic algorithm. Right. So with regard to the, the products we just discussed, having the isoniazid not in the TB RIF cartridge 
-hmm. from a diagnostic practical pra practic practical point of view doesn't make a lot of sense because oh. because you want to screen for INH resistance also right. in the ones that are RIF susceptible. So you have to use two cartridges. Um, and I won't comment any further on that. But right. but at the point I, 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 I want to make is that whatever algorithm you choose for your laboratory, I would I would um, support Charles's point, and that's also what I try to highlight in my slide that that it might be advisable to 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 have an approach where you have a screening PCR that says tape TB yes and no, that says RIF resistant yes or no, yes, that says no. INH yes and no, and then to have a follow up or a reflex test um, that you can then use in whatever case you decide and that makes sense from a financial point of view, that could be the ones that are TB positive RIF resistant, which brings down the number quite significantly. That could be the ones that are TB positive and that's it. Uh, so you mm -hmm. get rid of all the negatives um, for the expensive test. And that's, I think, a matter of, of puzzling it together, but that's also the approach that we're trying to follow now, Nata. One, one more point to add dead or alive, especially for high prevalence countries, this will be the breakthrough if we can find out is this mycobacteria dead or alive in the sample? Because we have TB surgery, a lot of TB surgery, and we find alive bacteria in cavities after full course of treatment. So this is this, this is what we have to focus on uh, for high prevalence countries, especially. I agree also very much with, with, with you, Florian. And I would, of course, say you also need to remember the NTM as well. And then, and, 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 and then uh, you, you can certainly, if you have an isoniazid or rifampicin resistant uh, case, you can certainly wait a day or two for, for, for the result of, of the whatever you use, line probe, the, the new gene expert second line, whatever system, even, even whole genome sequencing you can do within a few days if you have access to that. Because it's not that acute. You, you can still, you know, in our setting, we are mainly discussing diagnostics in a European setting. We, we, we do have, uh, um, we, we can wait two days and we can treat the patient in the meantime mm -hmm. with a regimen that is quite broad, but for two days until, or three days until we have additional results. It's not that acute, uh, so. <laughs> So I have here one, also one question about the about the LAM essay in the chat. So do you see um, a place for for this essay for either diagnosis of TB or also for um, observing the the treatment um, progression or treatment outcomes? Do, are we talking Fuji LAM test? Has he is just mentioning the LAM test. So I think the LAM urine test maybe okay, is yeah. mentioned. Fine, fine. Then, then we're talking yeah. the same. Plan. Not LAM. Yeah. Not <laughs> yeah. LAM. No, yeah. no, it's it's uh, just to say, I, I can only say the, the uh, a little bit share the Danish experience. In our setting, no, you know, we... now that we do microscopy culture and, and PCR and all the specimens we, we receive, we, we recently discussed whether there was a you know, a, a zone where, where that would actually give some additional diagnostics uh, that, that's not already covered by the present diagnostics. And, and what we ended up with, that would be HIV patients with a l very low CD4 count. That, there might be a role for a Fujilam test in that situation. It might also be very young children. Uh, but, 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 but I think the conclusion in, in our setting was, was uh, that, that, that it was a very, very narrow or limited uh, usefulness. I would even say if any in, in our situation where we have very few HIV positive patients with an extraordinary low CD4 count uh, so, and and um, and where we 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 have access to all the other diagnostics. So 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 uh, and then the other thing is we actually decided we'll try to to procure it and then then use it in these very special cases, very few cases, I guess less than a handful in a any setting per year. We couldn't buy it. Uh, it. It was not available when we asked at the European market. That might have changed. I'm not a market person, so so I can only say that when we we wanted to buy it, it was it was not available but it was still a very very narrow group of patients that that would benefit from it in our setting over yeah thank you very much so i i don't see further questions 
what is it? MBLA is a promising essay to answer that. Okay, there are two com two comments to that the MBLA essay might be also able to distinguish dead and alive bacteria. And also from an unknown person that INH and RIF cartridge is in the development, but will still take several years to until this reaches the market. So I think if you don't have any further urgent comments, that it was a very nice discussion already and a very interesting talk from all of you. And yeah, for the audience, I can remind you again, stay tuned next the next two weeks, same same time, same place. And I hope to see everybody soon um, in, in person, ideally. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. All the best. Thanks Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.